Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. Coming up later on the show, we're going to have an interview with United States Senator John Hoven, Republican from North Dakota. Senator Hoven is one of the members of Congress appointed to what's called a conference committee that is tasked with hammering out some sort of an agreement uh, now that the government's reopened, right? We all remember the government shutdown, longest federal shutdown in American history. And we reopen the government, and now this conference committee essentially has to hammer out some sort of a deal between Republicans and Democrats on border security uh, and other matters in order to avoid another government shutdown. You'll hear from Senator Hoven and uh, his perspective on that. I interviewed him. You'll you'll hear us talking about today. I interviewed him actually uh, Wednesday. Uh, shortly after the first meeting of this conference committee. So um, stay tuned for that. But until we get there, I'm going to talk about our other senator, uh, North Dakota Senator Kevin Kramer, recently elected in the 2018 election, took over from Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Now, you'll remember that at the end of Senator Heitkamp's term in office, there was some drama. And it was drama over a piece of legislation called Savannah's Act. Um, It was uh, named after a Native American woman who uh, went missing and was ultimately found murdered uh, here in the state of North Dakota. And uh, what it aims to do is it aims to put in place some reforms to address the problem with with people and and particularly women going missing from from North Dakota's Native American communities. Uh, It's you know, it's it's a real problem. Um, And it, it seems as though for some reason those cases are falling through the cracks. Savannah's Act seeks to address that situation. But after the election, we have that period, right, where we have the lame duck Congress, where all the people like Senator Heitkamp, who lost re-election, are still in Congress. And Senator Heitkamp was hoping to get Savannah's Act passed during that period. Well, it didn't happen. The legislature passed the United States Senate. Uh, Senator Hoven, by the way, voted for it. Senator Heitkamp obviously voted for it. Went over to the House of Representatives. Didn't come to a vote in the House of Representatives, and what we found out was that one Republican congressman um, was holding it up. Now, in December of last year, Congressman Kramer said that he supported the legislation, he'd like to see it passed, there were some amendments he wanted to see made, uh, but essentially whether or not it passed was out of his hands. Anyway, flash forward into 2019, Savannah's Act has been reintroduced, Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska has reintroduced it. Uh, Senator Hoven has co-sponsored it. Senator Kramer has decided to co-sponsor it. Now, this is where things get interesting. And and frankly, I think a little seamy, a little disgusting. And, and, and again, sort of a window into the high camp school of politics that, that really is, is sort of the North Dakota Democratic Party's school of politics since, let's face it, uh, for the last, you know, almost decade or so, the North Dakota Democratic Party has essentially been organized around what's best for the height camps. To the detriment, I think, of the other candidates in the party and the Democratic Party as a whole, you had two people with very large egos who wanted top ratings for, you know, Joel Heitkamp's radio show, uh, and then his sister, Senator Heidi Heitkamp, her political career. And it seems for a long time that's all North Dakota Democrats cared about. And I think very much it's true today. And I I, I think much in the way that that Democrats nationally uh, were hurt by their loyalty to the Clintons over the years and and how Democrats nationally are trying to move themselves away from the Clintons, I think North Dakota Democrats need to have that same sort of reckoning with the height camps. But on Savannah Zach specifically – Senator Kramer's being attacked for co-sponsoring the bill. Now, uh, first of all, let me, Joel Heitkamp, the talk radio host, um, he, uh, he teed off on, on Congressman Kramer on, on a, a post on his radio station's website. And he said, uh, quote, at the time, Kevin Kramer was a congressman in the House majority. He could have been the champion Savannah's Act required. Instead, he did nothing, nothing. Joel Heitkamp seethed in this post. He continued, every morning when Kramer looks into that mirror to shave, he sees the person responsible for stopping Savannah's act in the first place. He continued. Now, here's the interesting thing. Senator Heitkamp, I think, or or, excuse me, Senator Kramer has nothing to gain politically from co-sponsoring Savannah's act at this point. He said he supported it previously in the House. He never got a chance to vote on it. 
He didn't co-sponsor it, but he said he supported it. He's he's co-sponsoring it now. He wants to pass it now. And and I don't know that there's anything politically to be gained from that, right? Because he's... It, it's 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 earning him a lot of flack, uh, you know the the constituency that that I, I suppose you could argue that it might ingratiate him to the Native American communities, aren't likely to start voting Republican anytime soon. So you know what's he trying to do? I I I think that there's a a contingent of sort of bitter, butt hurt, high camp supporters out there who are so angry that their candidate is no longer in the United States Senate that there's literally nothing Kramer can do right, up to and including endorsing their candidate's signature piece of legislation. I mean, think about this for a moment. And by the way, Trick V. Olson uh, has a, uh, he, he had a, what I think was kind of a gross editorial cartoon. I posted it at sayanythingblog.com. You can find it on the Fargo Forum website as well. Um, and essentially, it, 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 it shows Congressman Kramer saying, you know, prior when he was a congressman, member of the United States House, saying uh, that, that he couldn't support Savannah's Act, but now that he's Senator Kramer, he can support Savannah's Act because it's got his name on it, making it sound like Kramer's calculation here was entirely political. I don't think that that's true. I think that Senator Kramer, uh, when he was a congressman, supported Savannah's Act. Now he's co-sponsoring it. But even stipulating for a moment that that's true, Right, stipulating for a moment that Kramer is trying to pull off some crass political maneuver here and, and win himself whatever, the envy of some constituency or some faction or whatever. I, I don't know. If that's really his motivation, who cares? Right? I, I mean, are we really so hung up on, on partisanship and point scoring that we're going to get upset when somebody – comes around to our side and supports legislation we support? I mean, because that's essentially what these at Joel Heitkamp, that's what he's doing. That's what Trick V. Olson is doing. That's what I, I wrote about this at SayAnythingBlog.com, and I got all the commenters out there saying, oh, Port, you're obsessed with Heitkamp. You just can't let it go. Well, you know who can't let it go? It's all the Heitkamp supporters who at this point can't even bring themselves to give Kevin Kramer credit when he's literally supporting legislation that they support. Kramer is supporting Savannah's Act. He's going to help it get through the United States Senate. Now, whatever you think of his motivations, he's on the right side of the bill. Okay, fine. I mean, you really can't ask much else from politicians because that's all politicians ever do. Republican, Democrat, whatever. They're always posturing to keep themselves elected. So I don't know. Maybe Kramer does see some motivation in this. I think it's a little ridiculous. Kramer supported Savannah's act previously, but fine, whatever. If you want to impute some negative connotation to his motivations, well, fine, but he's going to support it now. The thing it makes me think of, it, during the, the legislative session here in North Dakota, there was a bill introduced by Republicans. In fact, I think the prime sponsor was uh, State Representative Mary Johnson, Republican from Fargo. And the bill, it's, it addresses North Dakota's anti-discrimination laws. Now, in one session after another, Democrats and, and gay rights activists have been trying to get this legislation passed to get homosexuals uh, added to North Dakota's anti-discrimination statutes. Um, and those bills have been voted down. So what the Republican bill does, what, what Johnson's bill does, is it takes the parts that Representative Johnson feels can pass and puts them in a bill and puts it out there saying, okay, well, let's at least pass this much. And what do we get from the gay rights activists is they all start freaking out, saying, oh, we can't support this bill. It's not inclusive. It doesn't include transgender people. You know, they they got a parade of reasons not to support this bill. And and again, I think that's just partisanship. I think that's just left-wing activists being unwilling to compromise and work with Republicans to pass what's possible to be passed. Politics is the art of the possible, right? You know, you've probably heard that saying. Politics is the art of the possible. Because at the end of the day, people don't agree in politics. Democrats, Republicans see the world differently. And even within the Republican faction and the Democratic faction, there are additional factions, sub-factions, if you will, that don't even necessarily agree with one another within those parties. That's the way politics is. And so a lot of times to be successful in politics, what you have to do is you have to identify 
the areas where you can agree. And you have to identify the areas where you can actually pass some legislation and pass a policy and accomplish some things because that's all it is. The rest of it, if people aren't going to compromise, it's just not going to happen. From a certain perspective, that's what's so troubling about this government shutdown at the national level is who knows if we're ever going to be able to agree on a border wall. You'll hear Senator Hovind and I talk about it here in a little bit, but when Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, is saying a border wall is immoral, and meanwhile you've got President Trump saying that this conference committee that Senator Hovind is on is wasting their time if they don't consider a border wall, you got to wonder, how are they ever going to, what's possible from those positions? But let's come back to Savannah's Act. What's possible, possible in Savannah's Act is Republicans passing it. Because the primary sponsor on a bill is a member of the majority party in the United States Senate. Both of North Dakota's Republican senators are now supporting it. Is attacking Kevin Kramer really that important to Democrats? That they can't just be thankful that, that Savannah's Act's now possibly on a track to get passed? Right? We're going to get our skirts up over our heads because somebody somewhere was playing partisan politics? A big surprise. In politics, somebody was playing politics. I don't even think that's what was happening with Congressman Kramer. I, 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 think, I think Kramer supported Savannah's act previously. He said he did. There's no evidence that he didn't. He didn't get a chance to vote on it. And I think now that he's in the Senate, he continues to support it. And I think those attacking him now are people who are just bitter because Heidi Heitkamp lost. They hate Kevin Kramer. They love Heidi Heitkamp. They wish Heidi Heitkamp was still in the Senate. Therefore, Kevin Kramer, in their eyes, could do nothing right. And if you want to talk about why we're so divided as a country, if you want to talk about why, in a lot of ways, politics are so intractable and we can't get anything done, well, it's that attitude right there. It's that attitude when the guy comes around and he co-sponsors the legislation that you want to pass. The legislation that Senator Heitkamp went out swinging on, right? I mean, that's how she spent her final days in the United States Senate was trying to get that bill passed. Instead of just being thankful, instead of just being happy that maybe the policy is going to be on track to be implemented now, no, we got to attack Kevin Kramer because he plays for the wrong team. By the way, what is the point of politics if not to pass policy? I mean, what are we accomplishing? I listen, I will, I will, I, in, in, and I'm not a, I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a legislator. I'm not a politician. But if I was, I would tell you, I would work with whoever wanted to be on my side on a particular issue, right? I, I don't care. It could be a communist. It could be an outright communist. But if the communist and I agreed on some piece of policy, I would work with them to pass that policy. Because you know what? Again, politics is the art of the possible. And when it breaks down is when egos and tribalism and, and just, just hatred, just, just hatred bordering on a sort of ideological bigotry. Only when that sort of thing comes into play do we run into problems. Senator Hoven, coming up next. I have Senator John Hoven with me. Now, Senator Hoven, you are one of the appointees to what's being called the uh, Homeland Security Appropriations Conference Committee. But essentially, and I I guess you could correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this committee is tasked with with coming up with some sort of a compromise so that we can avoid another another government shutdown in the near future. And, And you guys just had your first meeting today, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's exactly right. Essentially... We're trying to come up with a Homeland Security funding package. And if we can do that, then we think we'll be able to move the rest of the appropriation bills to fund the remaining 25% of government out through the September 30th, the full fiscal year. We have a lot of uh, agreement on the other bills, so the, the key is we can come up with a solution on Homeland Security. Now, in your statement on today's meeting, you said, I quote, we need strong border security, including physical barriers, technology, and additional border security and law enforcement personnel. Not only do we need all three to secure the border, but these provisions have laid, have had bipartisan support in the past and are priorities laid out by our border security professionals. Now, that puts you in line with something that President Trump 
posted on Twitter yesterday. He said, I quote, if the committee of Republicans and Democrats now meeting on border security is not discussing or contemplating a wall or physical barrier, they are wasting our time. So, so tell me, after this first meeting, are, are we wasting our time? Is 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 the other side gonna gonna come to some sort of agreement on a on a physical barrier? Because it sure seems like President Trump saying that's you know that's the hill he's gonna die on. Well, I think we have a chance to get to a solution here, and I sure hope we do. What we talked about, and pretty much across the board, everyone agreed, we need strong border security. Now, the three things that go into that are people, technology, and a border barrier. Obviously, uh, some of the members, particularly Democrats, were uh, minimizing what's needed in a border barrier. Point I made is, one, look, you're going to have to have all three in order to get a deal here. And number two, let's get the professionals in, the career uh, customs and border protection people, border patrol people, and let's hear from them because they will tell us that they want all three, including a border barrier. That takes the politics out and you do what the professionals need and they're the ones out there getting the job done every day well sure i i'm not i'm not tied to the wall and, and frankly i mean for all that the president talks about a wall i don't think president trump's necessarily tied to a wall whether i, I think he's tied to some sort of a physical barrier but it doesn't have to be like a concrete wall i think like you said right uh, we, professionals tell us what you need what, what can we do to secure the border as a part of a larger package on immigration as a part of a larger package to get our government reopened yeah, that's exactly it. The president has said it doesn't need to be a, a concrete wall, and it doesn't need to be a wall from sea to sea. And he's saying barrier now because you know Democrats have said, oh, we, you know, can't be a wall. Well, fine, call it call it a border barrier then, and you put it where you need it. And the fact is, both Republicans and Democrats have voted for border barrier before. Again, call it fence, call it whatever you want. Uh, under President Obama, about 135 miles of border barrier under uh, President Bush, almost 500 miles. And uh, even back under Clinton, about 60 miles of border barrier. So, again, we should be able to uh, get funding for a border barrier uh, uh, where it's needed in the way it's needed, along with technology and people. Now, we have from from the other side, and, and specifically Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, I mean, she said she considers a, a border wall to be immoral. Now, I understand we're playing some games with semantics, whether we're calling it a wall or a barrier, but how do you, I mean, if, if, if that's the position, and, and certainly I, I know that Speaker Pelosi probably doesn't speak for all Democrats, but she is the leader of the, of the House of Representatives. If she's saying that a wall is immoral, how do you find common ground with that? Well, yeah, I I don't even understand that. I mean, good heavens, there's a wall uh, barrier, whatever you want to call it, uh, south of San Diego. I've been down there, and it's very important and very necessary for border security there. There's, uh, We have 654 miles of barrier and wall. And uh, so, uh, you know, that that, that doesn't work. Her, Her comment there just doesn't work, and we have to get beyond that, and her caucus has to get beyond that. Uh, in order for us to get agreement. And border security is fundamental to national security. It is one of the very primary responsibilities of government. And I and I think that this issue is a long-term, very important issue uh, that, that needs to be resolved. So it's not just part of funding the government for this year. This is part of making sure we get national security right. Are Republicans in a position because we 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 did the, the government shutdown and, and President Trump even before the shutdown he's out there saying you know blame me for it I'll take responsibility for it but I want the wall so government shuts down longest shutdown in American history we now have it reopened and we're doing some negotiating which obviously you're at the center of but have, have Republicans lost their position I mean now that the go- it seems to be the whole point of shutting down the government and I don't like the government shutting down but if you're gonna do it politically the point is it's 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 an inflection point right it's leverage it's you know we're going to shut the government down and there's going to be pain until we agree or we find some sort of compromise if we've reopened the government and now we're still saying well we still want a wall and the other side's still saying well the wall is immoral then have have, have we have republicans lost their leverage no no one wants a government shut down but uh, but what Democrats were saying is they re- they refused to negotiate because we were in shutdown. 
So the president uh, agreed that we'd uh, put a temporary funding piece in place to cover the 25 percent of government that, that hasn't been funded for this year. And then the Democrats had said they would negotiate. So now we're going to find out, are they going to negotiate or not? And uh, I'm hopeful that they will. Uh, the things we've put on the table, the things the president has put on the table, uh, include not just things that he wants or Republicans want. It also includes things that Democrats have said they want. That's what compromise is all about. And sure. they're things that the Democrats have voted for before. What sort of things are Republicans willing to give Democrats to, to, to get a compromise? I mean, what, what, what's on the table well, to, to, to give up? Yeah, I, well, I think, again, and, and we don't know if this is going to be a deal just focused on uh, border security or if we're going to need to go beyond that. The president offered a number of things in his compromise proposal that I think are, are very fair and that the Democrats have said they wanted. So it's not just funding for border security, including a barrier. He also uh, offered um, money for humanitarian assistance. Uh, he offered funding. He offered a, a three-year uh, extension on both DACA and TPS um, and a whole variety of things that Democrats have very much said they want. So I'm in terms of trying to compromise and get to a deal, I, I think he's shown he's willing to do that. President Trump is saying, uh, if we're not talking about a barrier, we're wasting our time. You, in your statement, said, you know, we got to have a physical barrier at the wall, fence, you know, wh whatever, whatever it is going to be. We got to have some sort of a physical barrier at the wall. If Democrats just, because you said we're going to go into this, we're going to find out if Democrats are going to negotiate. If they're not going to negotiate, are you willing to shut down the government again? Nobody wants to shut down. I'm going to do everything I can to get to a solution. Um, and I'm hopeful we will. What the president has said is that he also has the ability to exercise emergency authority uh, because of what's going on at the border and then utilize other funds, uh, you know, for building a border uh, barrier. Um, but the best way to do it is that we come to an agreement so it's done with Congress and the president coming together on a solution. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, what I, I think that's maybe the lesson Democrats learned during the Obama administration is I, I remember President Obama, after Republicans retook Congress, kind of famously said, well, you know, I still have a veto and I still have a pen, implemented a lot of policy via executive order that upon President Trump coming into office was immediately rolled back. And, and I don't think that's a good way to make policy because then we end up with a with a whipsaw back and forth, depending on who's in the, the law, it kind of hinges on who's in the White House in the moment. And that's that's not how it should be. That's not how the legislative process. So I, I hope we don't get to a point where President Trump, you know, uses exec, you know, his, his executive power, emergency powers to build the wall. But if he did, I mean, what what does that look like? Where does he pull? I mean, I, I guess you don't know. You're not in the executive branch, but that seems like 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 a like a major. And I mean, is, is there precedent for that sort of thing? Well, you just described it. But remember, two things here. I mean, you, you just kind of went through it. And yes, I can anticipate what kind of things he might try to do. But then, of course, that would be challenged immediately uh, in the courts. They'd, uh, the challengers would venue shop, which means, of course, they'd go to the Ninth Circuit. And you know how all of that goes. But the point I would make to you, Rob, is the president is offering bona fide compromises. He is trying to work something out that uh, has something that he needs because he wants to make sure we have security at the border, but also that Democrats feel has to be part of the deal. So he is trying to find a solution. And the other thing is the Democrats, Speaker Pelosi included, said uh, provided that we set up something to, to fund the government, that 25 percent that wasn't funded, that they would negotiate. So that's what needs to happen. Now, if uh, t tell us how this how how long a timeline do you get you you met for the first time today how often are you meeting are you meeting daily uh is it how long it, i mean when do we have no, to have a deal meet, we won't meet daily a lot of this work is done you know as, as you work with each other talk to each other and try to put something together so today was our first meeting we have until september 15th what i proposed is that we bring the um customs and border protection professionals in for a meeting and have them go through the things that we've put out on the table and say what they need. I know that they're going to say that means all three, including a barrier, just like you and I are talking about. And to me, that's the strongest position you can have. If the professionals who are out there putting their, you know, their well-being on the line every day, 
um, you know, uh, securing that border for us, keeping us safe. If they say, look, this is what we need, I think whether you're Republican or Democrat, you know, that's pretty compelling that that's what we should be doing. Why do you think we got to this point? And I, I have my theory on it. I, I feel like we got to this point because <laughs> for a long time, I, it feels like Republicans and Democrats alike ignored a, you know, a, a very large faction of the public, I would even say a majority, saying we want better border security. We don't want a porous southern yeah. border. And I think I think Republican administrations, I think Democratic administrations, Republican Congresses, Democratic Congresses, that faction got ignored. And I think we've we've just reached ahead where President Trump, I think, has a mandate on this issue from the electorate and is, has drawn a line in the sand and said, we're going to get this done. Yeah. And we're going to get it done now. Is, is, do you see it the same way? Yeah. 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 We need border security, just like we can't have sanctuary cities, Rob. We have to enforce the law. We have to secure. We have to have national security. Border security is fundamental to national security. And we have to support our military and we have to support our law enforcement and we have to have rule of law. And we, that's what keeps us safe. That's what protects our freedom of speech. That's what protects our well-being. So we can't have things like a porous border or not enforce our, uh, you know, our laws in a, uh, as far as sanctuary cities and those kind of things. That's what keeps us safe and strong. That serves everybody regardless of your opinion and whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever you are. And so, yes, it's going back to saying we need to secure that border. He ran on that. He's determined to do it. And it, 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 it's what we need to do. So, so why obviously secure the border? Um, I've long felt that we should have a tall fence or a tall wall, proverbially, proverbially at the at the border but also a wide fence i mean to me that seems like just such an obvious avenue for right. compromise and say let's make right. it as impossible let's make it almost impossible to illegally immigrate but also make right. it easier to legally immigrate right because that's i i want legal immigration why has that been so hard that path seems obvious yeah well you're right and i and i think the way to get there and this is what we're trying to do Secure the border so people feel the border is secure and enforce the law. And then, as you say, go to an immigration system that makes sense. And that means we need to go to a merit-based system. If you look at the four principles that the president put out last year, he said, okay, here's what we need to do. One, we need, we'll address DACA. We get border security, including a border barrier. We end chain migration, end visa lottery, and go to a merit-based system. And, and that is the right approach. So you get that border security, and then you get a system that makes sense, and it, and it really should be um, you know, a, a merit-based system. What about critics who are saying, you know, essentially, um, Democrats are just going to take the position that we don't have to compromise with Republicans on anything, and if the government gets shut down, the Republicans are going to get blamed for it anyway. Heck, Repub President Trump himself said, "Blame me for it." Uh, wh what do you say to people like that? Like, in this, it's just a no-win situation. Democrats have have no reason to compromise at all. I think that shows up at the ballot box. I mean, I, I think now if they don't start, look, I think it is compelling that we get border security. Uh, including a uh, border barrier where we need it. I think that's compelling. And I think if, if uh, Democrats, our colleagues on the other side, don't join with us now to get that kind of solution, I think people at the ballot box will say, no, we want border security and, and vote accordingly. Your majority leader, Mitch McConnell, is on the record now saying today that he doesn't feel – he, he doesn't feel there's any appetite for another shutdown. Other Senate Republicans saying the same thing, just just no appetite for another government shutdown. Uh, with, with them saying things like that, um, I, I mean, that, that's got to make it pretty tough for, for your committee to go in and, and, and draw a hard line on, on, on border security with, with Democrats who, again, as we just said, may or may not have, you know, feel like they have uh, a reason to, to compromise. Well, nobody wants a border shutdown, but I think the dynamic has changed. The Democrats said they were willing to negotiate. Um, you know, if we funded that remaining 25% and then started the negotiation, we have done that. 
if they now stonewall, I think people will see that for what it is. So I think that does put some pressure on them to come to the table, and I sh- and and they need to. And so I, I, again, I hope that's what happens. Senator Hovind, thanks for your time. All right, Rob. Good to be with you. That's it for the Plain Talk podcast today. Remember, new episodes come out Monday through Friday, uh, right away in the morning. In fact, I schedule them to post at 4 a.m. I don't actually get up at 4 a.m. to uh, make the donuts, as it were. Uh, No, I schedule them to post at 4 a.m. And then if you subscribe to the podcast via services like Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, uh, Pocket Casts, The service of your choice, it could be delivered immediately to your device. It could be ready for you. So in the morning when you're eating your eggs, you're combing your hair, you're getting dressed for work, you could be listening to this podcast. If you go to SayAnythingBlog.com, you click the Plain Talk podcast link at the top. You'll see all the different links for getting uh, getting subscribed, getting signed up. uh, Or you can just follow the podcast at SayAnythingBlog.com. That's not a bad way to do it either. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.